All right, please open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. We are taking a five-week break from the book of Romans and are making our way through the book of Jonah together. We started last week, and by way of reminder, we are calling this series through the book of Jonah, Jonah and the God of Compassion. Jonah and the God of Compassion. And last week, we went through the first three verses, which really set the stage for the whole book as God commissions Jonah to go to Nineveh. And one of the realities of the book of Jonah is that the book of Jonah is primarily about God. God is the main character. He is the first one acting, and he is the main character throughout this book. And what each one of us should come away with at the end of our study through this book is a deepened understanding of and hopefully a deeper love for God. We should be captivated by this God who is willing to call upon winds and fish and sinful prophets and worms all to bring about his will. The book of Jonah shows us what God is like. He is a gracious God. He is a loving God. He is a God who hates sin and rescues sinners. He is a God who controls all of the elements and will summon them to bring about his plan and to get the attention of his people. In the first three verses, God commissions Jonah, and we saw that God's word came to Jonah, and then God's word is disobeyed by Jonah. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah seeks to flee to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, a port city. He paid the fare and is on a ship seeking to flee the presence of the Lord. Jonah is a prophet of the Lord and is an Israelite. He is one of the people of God, and yet he is rebelling against his God. And in this moment, his heart is not in submission to the Lord. He is rebelling against God, and yet God will not let him get away. God's compassion and God's love and God's mercy is put on full display in this book and in the verses that we will look at today. And today, we need to let our hearts be gripped by the character of God, by the lengths God will go to to bring about his will and to capture the attention of his people. So let's read together. Jonah, we're going to be going through verses 4 through 16 of chapter 1, starting in verse 4. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, 
O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Let's pray. God, we pray this morning that you would affect our hearts with your word, that you would catch our attention with your greatness. Pray that we would be appropriately impressed by you, drawn in by you, that we would see what we must about you, and Lord, that you would bring to light, that you would unearth within us what we need to see about ourselves. We pray in Christ's name, amen. At the heart of Jonah's rebellion against God is that he does not see God rightly. The heart of Jonah's rebellion and disobedience and fleeing from the presence of the Lord is that his view of God is skewed. He is not thinking rightly about God. There is something about God that Jonah is dissatisfied with, and Jonah thinks his way is better. Jonah, in this moment, seems to be far more impressed and far more convinced of his own thoughts regarding this matter than God's thoughts. And in looking at Jonah, it's easy to wonder, what is going on in this man? The word of the almighty sovereign God came to him. Jonah no doubt knows something of Israel's history and knows this God, Yahweh God, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And he knows something of Israel's history and how God brought them into the promised land. And this is the same God who delivered Goliath into David's hands and so on. Time after time, God demonstrates himself to be mighty, to be good, to love his people, to be powerful, and to be trustworthy. Yahweh God is a God like no other, and his character that shines forth in these verses put on display how majestic and powerful he is, even if Jonah doesn't see it yet. Jonah should know the greatness of Yahweh, the God of Israel, but in this moment he is not impressed and he thinks he is convinced that his way is better. So he flees. Jonah, what is wrong with you? We can't relate to Jonah at all in this way, can we? This is what we do when we sin. And today as we look closer at these verses, we need to see what Jonah needed to see, and that is how absolutely impressive God truly is. How trustworthy God is, how mighty God is, how powerful God is, how good God is. In these verses, the impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in five ways. There's really five scenes that put on display the impressiveness of the Lord, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. The impressiveness of the Lord, or the impressiveness of Yahweh God, is displayed in five ways. Five events or five scenes that take place here that unfold how captivating, how truly awesome God is. So number one, let's look at this together. The impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in number one, the fierce graciousness of the Lord. The fierce graciousness of the Lord. And this is demonstrated in verses four through six, where the Lord brings or hurls a great wind on the sea. Jonah has boarded a ship to Tarshish, and it is at sea, and God steps right into the middle of Jonah's rebellion, right into the middle of his seeking to flee the presence of the Lord. Jonah had a foolish hope that he was going to be able to flee the presence of the Lord. Lord. 
As we saw last week, God said go 500 miles northeast, and Jonah seeks to go 2,000 miles west. And it is clear Jonah is not only wanting to disobey the instruction, but as it says twice in verse 3 and again in verse 10, Jonah is fleeing the presence of the Lord. But thankfully... God does not relinquish his sovereignty to man's rebellion. And so the Lord hurls a great wind in verse 4. And this wasn't a natural wind. This was a supernatural wind. It wasn't a storm like all other storms. We see in the second half of verse 4, the ship was about to break up. And the sailors know this is no ordinary storm. Look at verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried out to his God. This storm caused the sailors to become afraid. They knew something supernatural is at work, and they're trying everything in this moment to survive. They're fearing for their lives, and these are men who spent their lives at sea, and they're abandoning cargo. They're doing anything else, anything that comes to mind that they may find some way to escape. What they fear is imminent death. And yet in the middle of this fierce storm that will not relent and that is causing the professional sailors to fear desperately for their lives is a gracious God. In the middle of this fierce storm is a gracious God who is not done with his servant and is actually putting on display for these sailors his awesome power. Jonah is seeking to flee from the presence of the Lord and the Lord will not let him. And at the center of this fierce storm is a gracious God. And that reality is is a reality that each of us would do well to just store away in our heart. Because God's character is unchanging and great comfort can come for you. When you find yourself in a trial, and regardless of if your trial is one that is the discipline of the Lord, like here in Jonah's case, or if your trial is one that is simply allowed by God as a means to making you more like Jesus. Whatever the reason, the reality remains that behind the storm is a gracious God. And if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, behind every storm, behind every trial, is a sovereign God who is gracious and compassionate. And a God who loves his children and is sovereign to call on winds and seas if that's what it takes. It was gracious of God to seek out his disobedient servant and to not allow him to remain long in his sin. It was loving of God to not leave Jonah in his rebellion. but to step into his rebellion with loving, intense discipline. If we rebel against God, if if you're a follower of Jesus and, and you wander and you stray, there's comfort in the book of Jonah for you because we see that God is the kind of God who will track down his children and will discipline them to bring them into conformity with his will because he loves his children. Children, young ones here now, hear this. It is good when your parents step into your rebellion. It is good when your parents step into your defiance into your foolishness, and when they provide loving discipline in your life. It is gracious of them to not leave you in your sin. Do you understand that? That is a kindness from them. That is a kindness from the Lord for you. It is gracious of them to not leave you in your sin. Even if it is hard for you, it is what is good. We all need to be reminded of that. 
It was good for Jonah that God stepped into his defiance. And you know what? It's good for us when God steps into our defiance as well. We should long for it. We should long for the discipline of the Lord. We should long for God to help us to do whatever it takes to turn from our sin, to see our sin. The sailors knew this wasn't an ordinary storm. They all were calling on their gods, and yet the prophet of the Lord is asleep. Look at the second half of verse five. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Finally, someone who sleeps more soundly than I do. And then in verse six, the prophet of the Lord is instructed by a pagan sailor to pray. So much is backwards in Jonah's life. Jonah is to be the servant of the Lord, and he's running from the Lord. The pagans are seeking divine assistance in the midst of the storm, and Jonah is asleep. Jonah has a spiritual problem as he is seeking to flee from the presence of the Lord, and yet Jonah's rebellion will in no way thwart the purposes of God. God is not dependent upon Jonah to accomplish his purposes, and the captain here is wondering, how is it that you are asleep? And notice this, the words on the lips of the pagan captain, they should be a rebuke to Jonah. Perhaps your God will be concerned with us. That's the message Jonah should be proclaiming. God is concerned about his creatures and calls us to repent and to follow him and know him. Even if today we go down with the ship and on the lips of this pagan captain is hope in the graciousness of some God out there somewhere who might rescue them. The pagan captain is asking, is your God kind enough to save us? And again, what a rebuke to Jonah, a plea for some God somewhere to have compassion. God reveals something here as a rebuke to Jonah and a lesson for us that God is good and abundant in mercy and kindness and compassion. And where no other God can command the seas and save those in need, God does both. God puts on display his terrifying omnipotence, and yet it is rooted in his graciousness. He could have moved on from Jonah. He could have washed his hands of Jonah. He could have raised up another prophet. You don't want to take my message? I'll get someone else. But he he doesn't. He's patient, and he's gracious, and he's compassionate. Jonah loves his sin and does not want to submit or be near to the Lord, but he can't escape the Lord. And what he finds is that the way of the transgressor is hard. How much must Jonah have loved his sin of rebellion and disobedience of God that he would act so irrationally? Right? It was shocking that the word of God would come to him in the first place. That God would set him apart to be an ambassador of his word to a wayward people. A tremendous privilege, right? Yet Jonah loves his sin. He thinks his way is better. He doesn't want to submit to God. And the sobering reality is that Jonah is far more like us than we probably care to admit. What sin, what sin is in your life What sin in your life do you love so much that you are walking in continual disobedience, irrational disobedience to the fiercely gracious God? What what sin are you unwilling to let go of? And what, what might it take from the Lord What stepping into your life might it take to get your attention, to wake you up? God says, go this way. Jonah goes the other, but God doesn't let him. The impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in his fierce graciousness. Number two, the impressiveness of the Lord is displayed, number two, in the indisputable sovereignty of the Lord. Indisputable sovereignty. Sovereignty. 
Look at verse 7. Each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Now picture the emotional intensity at this moment. Picture the emotional intensity of this scene. They have no doubt tried to sail out of the storm. They have thrown overboard their cargo. They have called out for supernatural assistance as every man is calling on his God. The boat seems to be breaking up on the verge of falling apart. It is clear in their minds that this is no ordinary storm. This is a supernatural storm and they cannot escape it. And they're going, what are we going to do? I don't know. The sailors have concluded that this storm was a result of someone somewhere committing an act against a God, and so they cast lots in order to find out whom the guilty individual is. Let's cast lots. And this wasn't a wager. It wasn't for something. It wasn't a game in this moment. They are grasping at everything to try to figure out what is going on. Water is everywhere. The storm is raging. They've done all of these things, and they're convinced that someone on the ship, like a magnet, has attracted the anger of a god. And so they turn to a method of chance to determine the culprit. Yet this is no game of chance. Right? Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. God is clearly sovereign over this storm, and God is sovereign over the lot. And from the strongest wind to the smallest stone, God is in control. And we have the benefit of, as we are reading, knowing God called Jonah, knowing God ran, or Jonah ran from the presence of the Lord, knowing God caused the great wind, knowing that God directed, ordained, and caused the lot to fall on Jonah. And God here is indisputably sovereign over every detail that is taking place. In the midst of Jonah's rebellion, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the pagan sailors, in the midst of a game of chance, God is directing his purposes and working out his will into perfect completion. Jonah wanted to get away from God. He didn't trust God. He didn't like God's ways. And yet God is powerful. God is sovereign and God is using everything at his disposal to work in the heart of Jonah and in the hearts of these sailors. And listen, whatever is going on in your life right now, the, the hard relationship, the tight finances, the hard doctor's report, the wayward child, the difficult work situation, the challenging business deal, God is still sovereign. And he can call and does call on winds and seas and lots. And as we will see fish and winds and plants and worms, all to bring about his good sovereign will. Why would we ever not trust him? Do you struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle with anxiousness about what might happen? I've got the best news for you. God is in control. God is sovereign. God loves his children. God loves to give good things to his children. God is trustworthy. And he's patient. And he's compassionate so much so that he will make things really hard to help us learn what we must and to put us where we need to be. The impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in the fierce graciousness of the Lord and the indisputable sovereignty of the Lord. And number three, the impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in the divine patience of the Lord. The divine patience of the Lord. We see this in verses eight and nine. Then they said to him, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? The lot falls on Jonah and now he's getting questioned. He's getting interrogated. Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? 
And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Right here, we just see God is so patient, supernaturally patient with his wayward servant. Jonah has been set apart as a prophet of the Lord. He is given a message from God and he rebels and seeks to flee from the almighty God. He is here seen as the cause for the storm and the sailors are asking a question of Jonah, a bunch of questions of Jonah. Why has this calamity struck us? Rapid firing question ensues and Jonah pulls out his resume. I'm a Hebrew And I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And the fact that God does not strike Jonah down right here for such blasphemy is astonishing. Really, Jonah? You fear the Lord? Why are you here? Why are you running from his presence? Why are you walking in disobedience? Why are you not obeying? Why are you not trusting? There's a lesson for us here. Don't rely on the right Christian answer to guard your heart. Jonah can repeat the right answer, but he's not living the right answer. He can recite the correct response, but he's not living in light of that correct response. His heart right now is not living what he thinks he knows. And it's important for us to to remember that just because we can fill in the blanks of the Christian life, just because we can say the right responses, just because we can put an outward front of the right things, It doesn't mean that everything is okay with your soul. Jonah puts up a good front and he claims to even fear God, yet he is self-deceived and yet God is not finished with Jonah. And again, the compassion of God, the divine patience of God is put on full display. And it is comforting to see the divine patience of the Lord. But we dare not test his patience with defiant sin. We see no hint of brokenness or even awareness in Jonah of his sin as he has to give an account at this point. And yet God is patient with him. God does not abandon him to his own self-deception, to his own foolishness. In fact, God is doing many things in the midst of his foolishness. And that's what we see next. Number four, the impressiveness of the Lord is displayed in the multiple purposes of the Lord. You see, Jonah is going through this trial and Jonah is rebelling against the Lord, but there are many things that God is doing at the same time. God is bringing about his will. He is working a million things together all at once. And here a dialogue takes place in verse 10. We see God's will. We see his purposes start to play out. It says in verse 10, Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. It is clear to the pagans how foolish Jonah is for running from the Lord. And then in verse 11, So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. It was going from bad to worse. And so verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. The storm proclaimed the omnipotence of God better than Jonah could in this moment. And these heathen sailors were more aroused and alarmed by the flagrant disobedience of Jonah than the prophet of God himself was. And again, what a rebuke this must have been for Jonah. You ever find yourself in that position? Someone around you, maybe even a non-believer, is more shocked by your behavior than you are? 
That is shameful for a believer. It's also an evidence of how truly deceiving sin is. And a common tragedy is when those around you see and care more about your sin than you do. What a moment of shame and blindness. We would all do well to remove every contingency that we place on how we can be addressed in regards to our sin. Any obstacle that we might put out in front of us to keep someone away from bringing to us our sin, we need to remove it. We need to understand how easy it is to be self-deceived. To be in one moment running from the very presence of God and in the next moment claiming to fear him. We're capable of this. We need to be approachable. We need to be humble. We need to care more about holiness, repentance of sin, than how we're addressed in regards to our sin. Jonah is starting to see the error of his ways. He knows it is because of him that this calamity has come upon them. Yet what is Jonah's attention fixed on? It's himself running from God. Jonah here thinks, just throw me over. If I would just die, that would be the end of my problems. But God isn't finished with him yet. Jonah fails to realize it here, but in God's dealing with him, he is also working in the lives of the sailors. He is also breaking down the hard heart of the disobedient prophet so that a pagan people would hear the Lord's message. He's also bringing to pass a real story that will be preserved in our Bibles, has been preserved for the benefit of followers And you see, at any point in time, God is doing a million things to accomplish his plan, and you most likely are a very small piece of what is going on in the sovereign plan of a very big God. That's not how we often feel. Oftentimes, we are the center of what is going on. And from our perspective, we're the center of what's going on in front of a small God. That's what's happening in Jonah's life here. God has purposes for Jonah, for the sailors, for Nineveh, for Israel, and for every person who would read the book of Jonah for all of history. And we see God's multiple purposes put on display here as he is summoning a storm to produce what he desires in his servant to step into the lives of these pagan sailors and to bring about the obedience of his servant that a pagan uh, city would hear his message. And in verse 3, the sailors try one last effort. Look at verse 13. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land But they could not, for the sea once again was becoming even stormier against them. It was bad before, it got really bad, and now it is really, really, really bad. In verse 14, then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased." The sailors didn't want to throw Jonah into the sea for they knew what his fate would be and they pleaded with God to not put innocent blood on their hands yet Jonah, he was not innocent and God was not done with him also. Finally, someone calls out to the Lord but it isn't Jonah. It's these pagan sailors and they say, God, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and they end verse 14 saying, You have done as you have pleased. They get it. They know God has purposes and is powerful enough to accomplish his ways. They don't want Jonah to die. They don't want his blood on their hands. 
Once again, Jonah is shamed by these pagan sailors who have more regard for one life than Jonah did for a whole city that he refused to bring the word of the Lord to. And so the sailors are here looking for another way. You see, the sailors only see the storm. They only see the waves. They only see the man. They do not see what God sees. And while they are subject to the elements, God is controlling the elements. They only see death for Jonah. They cannot see past the waves to see the fish that God is bringing Jonah's direction. And to the sailors, sending Jonah into the sea is the end. But for God, this is just the beginning of Jonah's journey. Recognizing the reality that God is accomplishing purposes far beyond our immediate circumstances can be so helpful. Because when we find ourselves in challenging circumstances, we can trust him with the outcome. We don't need to control what is happening around us. God can command seas and winds and fish. We don't need to control what is happening around us. We need to address what is going on within us. And we need to address what is proceeding from us. What we should have fix our attention, what our, our attention should be fixed on is that we are being the kind of people that God calls us to be. And then we trust God. We trust God. Lastly, the impressiveness of the Lord lastly is displayed in the desired outcome of the Lord. It ends just as God would have it. Verse 15, they picked up Jonah, they threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The sailors throw Jonah into the sea and the sea calms and any question or thought of doubt as to this being a divine storm is appeased as Jonah enters the sea and the sea calms. And the pagan sailors' response is to fear the Lord greatly. They offered sacrifices to the Lord and they made vows. Jonah meant his rebellion for evil, but God intended it for good. And God is accomplishing in Jonah what he desires. And God brings about what seems to be genuine repentance and faith in these sailors. They respond with more than a desire to appease God and move on with their lives. They worship God in the offering of sacrifices after the sea calms. And they make vows before him to do more. And how kind of God to do this. He was not obligated to step into the lives of these pagan sailors. They were just on another journey, taking another load of cargo, making another day's wage when Jonah stepped onto their boat. And yet God steps right into their day. He displays his awesome power before them and they fear him and they worship him. If you're not a believer in Jesus, if you're not a believer, your being here today may be God stepping into your life and revealing something powerful about himself, something wonderful about himself. Because listen, as you heard when Scott shared The God of all creation, the one who accomplishes his purposes in Jonah's life here, who is commanding the seas, the one who commands the lot, that one is holy, he only ever does good, he is righteous, he is just, and each one of us, you And me, we have sinned against him. You know that to be true. You violate your own moral code, much less his moral code. And before him, you are guilty and under his condemnation because of your sin. And he sent his son, fully God and fully man, to come and to live perfectly And then his son went to a cross and gave his life willfully as a sacrifice, as a substitute to take on the judgment and the wrath and the penalty that 
we deserve in our sin. And he took that wrath. He satisfied that wrath. He died and he conquered death. He rose from the grave. And he offers salvation for anyone who would repent of their sins and turn to him in faith. That's the gospel. That's the most powerful thing that God could ever do to change a heart, to change a life, to change a nature from one that is in opposition to him to one that is in fellowship with him. And that is the offer before you today. Will you repent? Will you submit your life to Jesus? The ship is going down and you are on it and you must turn to Christ. Or else you will not know him as savior, but you will know him as judge. And no one can stand, no one can stand in his presence under his wrath. God loves, he loves, he loves to extend his mercy and his grace What can we learn from this also? God does what he pleases. He does what he pleases and he will turn things upside down to make us see that and to believe that and to walk in that. He'll even put you inside of a fish if necessary. Are, are you cultivating a heart? Are you shepherding your heart to be rightly impressed with God? to be rightly impressed by God so that when a hard instruction comes, rather than thinking you know better, rather than, than fleeing from him and walking in disobedience, you are ready to trust him. Are there any instructions that you're running from right now where you are not properly impressed with God? You think you're no, your way is better. If so, repent. Repent in those things and trust the Lord. Let's pray. God, you are truly awesome. You are sovereign and you are good and you are trustworthy. And yet it is so easy for us to forget that, to think that we know better. To think that we have things figured out, to think that you're missing something. Lord, I pray that as we consider these verses from Jonah chapter 1, I pray that our hearts truly would be captivated to see you as the great God that you are, that we would fix our gaze upon your greatness and that we would be awed. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to bring about the changes in our hearts, in our thinking, in our lives that would be pleasing to you. We love you. We thank you for your word. Let us respond now in song and in submission to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.